Hello and welcome to the Surgical Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Haider Al-Hakim, the Third Eye Doctor. Pull up a chair and get ready for some candid and uncompromising discussion with experts, innovators, agitators, and influential people from every corner of health and well-being. From inside the hospital to at home in the kitchen, we're leaving no stone unturned in our quest to uncover the secrets of healthier, happier, more successful, and less stressful lives. Thank you so much for joining us, and without further ado, let's meet this episode's guest. Hi Sven, thank you so much for coming on today. Hi, Hello. nice to meet you again. Lovely, lovely. Mate, you know, you sort of get everywhere. I mean, how do you do it? Um, there's this saying that uh, um, ignorance is the mother of all adventures, so sometimes it's just about uh, jumping somewhere, I suppose. Have you always been a jumper? <laughs> Good question. Um, no. I remember when I was in my earlier teens that I thought it was super scary to move from my high school to the center of the city, which is probably less than a kilometer, uh, to go watch a movie with some friends. And it was, it was very spooky. Um, uh, and I did like to do things that I was afraid of. So I always tried to push myself further and further. And then suddenly the, the world became the neighborhood. Um, so I guess it's all about uh, the, the journey and, and then gradual steps. Yeah, yeah. And 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 um, when when did the medicine journey start? Oh. Um, so if you call it, if, if the starting point is medicine, it's the studies, then it would be uh, age 20. Um, but I guess like many of us um, beforehand, I, you know, was like a, a lifeguard and did some first aid stuff and, uh, you know, all of this, um, but actually did not want to be a doctor until shortly before I started to apply for medical school. That's weird. So like you didn't have childhood dreams of becoming a doctor and oh, things no. like that. Oh, no. My dad is a psychiatrist and a neurologist. And I thought this is horrible, you know, I thought this is boring, you always hang out in your same practice. Um, people just come with problems all the time. Um, thought it was pretty much a routine job sort of thing, and wanted to become a special forces operator. So I was in, in the forest all the time doing a lot of martial arts, sports, it was a pretty, I think I was a pretty spooky child. Um, and then I joined the army. And even then, during basic training, they pulled me to the side because I was too good of a shooter. <laughs> I knew too much. And they said, this is not normal what's going on here. So, yeah, I switched from the uh, from the other end of the spectrum to medicine, I guess. Wow. Wow. So what <laughs> what what kind of martial arts were you interested in? Ah, um, so I've done, I think I started with the typical, the, the karate and stuff as a child, and then uh, went into Wing Chun Eskrima, that's stick fighting. Um, then uh, Jiu Jitsu, I thought was quite, quite exciting. It's, it's pretty popular among military people also. Um, because they say, you know, if, you, you know, if you're on the ground and then you're choking and then what you need to do to succeed is to keep calm and then take constructive action. And that's something that they, they I think, want to teach people with that. Um, and then I think the one that I liked the most in the end was uh, Muay Thai, so Thai boxing, and then uh, Krav Maga. Um, so I left the others after a while. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be quite an effective, uh, um, yeah. you know, the last one. Um, Krav Maga, you know, quite quite effective in, in real life combat situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it about that that makes it, you know, have that tradition? I mean, many of these martial arts, they create artificial rules. Uh, for example, that you have to wear a certain outfit, um, the gi, or uh, you have mattresses on the ground, or, you know, there are certain things that you need to practice. And that's great, but it doesn't translate into something that's really useful in reality most of the time, right? And in Krav Maga, they would have things where you train in a staircase so somebody attacks you in the staircase or you're sitting in the car somebody you know points a knife at you from behind what do you do now somebody is threatening you with a bar stool the things that you would encounter more likely in a real life scenario where even if you're really trained in karate then it, it just can become complicated um 
And the problem with jujitsu is you often end up, especially the Brazilian one, you end up on the ground. And if you're on the ground and it's just one opponent, that's okay. But if you, there are more people that want to help, then you will just get kicked in the face. So you don't want to be on the ground often. Um, uh, yeah, things, things like that. And also, I mean, Thai boxing is a lot of boxing and kicking. And this is cool if, you know, if you have protective gear and you're training with other people. If you're in a real life scenario, sometimes you might just have somebody who's pushing you against the wall or is like holding you and you don't want to destroy their bones right away, right? This, this could be like a yeah. disproportionate response. And then having some some lighter ways of getting out, uh, doing a lever that doesn't like create constant damage, but it's, it's just giving you control for the moment is is more useful. So you get a, a broader range of, of things that allow you to give like a, a measured response to whatever threat you're you're receiving. Does that make sense? Mm, mm, mm. And 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 um I was gonna ask about um whether whether you've you've been in situations where you've had to use it. Oh yeah. Um oh yeah. <laughs> I mean yes, but um so wow. few very few. Wow. And I feel like the situations never escalated mm -hmm. because uh people knew that or instantly knew that it, it wouldn't be a good idea right so i think that the key purpose of training for all of this is that you end up not needing to use it because people realize that you're not afraid um mm -hmm. and that you might be a threat and that you're not interested in causing just trouble for nothing um good prevention so it's just so it, i mean i've been in you know quite um you know pre-violent situations i mean I've, mm -hmm. uh, i mean i've had a few fights and so on uh, as a as a child <laughs> but not in sort of serious adult uh, situations. And I, re and I can relate to say, you know, to that saying that, it, that, that if they realize that you're in a confident state or in a state of calm and, you know, let's say, okay state being in this really tense, uh, violent situation, the other person does back down. Um, and yeah. I'm not the type that escalates things as well. Oh. I mean, I've been in situations where people have threatened me with, with knives and, and, and screwdrivers and so on. Mm -hmm. But I've decided to not escalate, be calm. I mean, I haven't had any official martial art training. I, I mean, I've done boxing. I've, I've, I've done a lot of boxing. Um, so yeah, I, I can, I can relate to that, you know, being in, in a state of calm when everyone else is losing their, um their minds. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect us to be talking about that, but it's really refreshing, honestly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I love uh, combat sports. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was the thing that I'd go to every time I was, you know, upset or frustrated or angry or, you know, I'm supposed to be studying, but I just go to, um, you know, the boxing thing. Um, and then and then UFC came along and that's yeah. kind of taken over, really. That's that's oh, yeah. taken over the world of fighting yeah are you a fan of that or i mean i generally really really struggle and i say that as a german person uh, and it's also true for soccer um i struggle to watch other people do sports while i sit this is mm. bad for me um i love to do it actively uh or if if sort of i see it in in, in real time that's okay but I, I just can't sit there with a drink uh, and some snacks yeah. and see it it's uh, i don't know the cognitive dissonance is too strong <laughs> you can't switch off by the no. sounds of it yeah i mean unless it's like education and i feel like okay i'm learning some techniques but then i'd rather watch actually somebody teaching techniques because then i, I get sort of i learn exactly why they do it and i don't have just have to guess what was that just now um yeah how often do you train do you, do you um, so I, I went I left this was a, back in the day when I did it a lot and then I stopped and then I do daily workouts but nothing martial um, but I actually have decided just this month to go back into it because I really start to miss it um, and uh, and it can be a really nice crowd of people that you meet there also right I mean depends a bit on the sport right some can be quite not 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 so my type let's say but in other cases I find it it's very uh very, very good communities what, what what do you think going back to what kind of um, arts? so yeah I, I really like jujitsu 
Mm. It's very technical. Um, the problem I have with it is that you often end up having like tensions and back pain and shoulder pain, mm. and that's very distracting if you want to be productive. Um, so probably not. And then also this like very sweaty hugging for minutes on the ground. I'm not sure if it's still my cup of tea. Um, probably are going... you are you a gi kind of man or or, or a no gi man? No gi. No gi. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I prefer uh, Krav Maga. Again, going back to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. man. Yeah, are you are you a fan of um Eddie Bravo and and sort of his his uh, was it ninth ninth planet BJJ? Do you, you know much him? about him? No. Oh yes, yes. I mean, he's 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 devised a new, you know, it's it's not. I mean, it is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but you know, like an American brand um, of it. Um, I'll send you some videos of it, but it's you know non gi and. Yeah, and um, it's developed, you know, from the UFC. Really, it's sort of a UFC form of uh, BJJ. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks it looks very cerebral. You know, there's a lot of thinking involved on the ground. Oh yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, if we connect that to your book, do you think that this is something that can be helpful to? Uh avoid or get out of a burnout situation or to build really yeah yeah I, I think you know i think the combination of mind and body if, if you can mm -hmm. find a way of optimizing that you know mm -hmm. where it sort of speaks to each other and you know there's a natural flow uh, mm -hmm. then definitely um i mean the way i wrote my book was actually uh, doing physical activity and dictating the book at the same time oh, so really? i felt yeah so i felt that that was the best kind of connect between you know because you know you want to write something but something stops you and it's usually your mind or your ego or some other yeah. superpower that that stops you in your track so i felt that if i was doing some physical activity it switches off your ego it switches off that that sort of negative mind you know that negating mind yeah. um because your body's too busy you know trying to control the uh, physiological space um and then well, you're you're sort of less inhibited i think i mean yeah. for me you know i and was you did that at the same time right so you took the the physical activity to then bring yourself in the state and at the same time you would then produce the content yeah yeah That's interesting yeah so i'm coming across some you know like uh especially over here in berlin and in, in the startup scene mindfulness has been a big topic um for many decades not decades many years now maybe a decade um and um then it's been it's been applied by people who are very competitive so the school of thought was oh i need to do at least one session of mindfulness every day in order to be more mindful, to be, I don't know, more productive and a bit faster than the others. And um, and then people would celebrate themselves for having done their mindfulness session this morning, or I meditated this morning. And what I'm seeing now more and more is a counter movement that says, well, stop celebrating yourself for that. Because if you do that, it already proves that you didn't get the point because mindfulness is not something you have done in the past and it still is there. Mindfulness is something that is right now because the only thing that is here is right now. And also, it shouldn't be something that, um, you know, you do with the aspiration of being more productive, but it should be something that makes you wake up, basically, and and and, and go on a different level. And and so um, what I just heard from what you said, I think, is more in line with this, what for me seems to be the the the, the, the more, the, well, I was just going to say it's the new school of thought, but actually it's the original school of thought. It's just been rediscovered right now. But where you say, you know, I, I practice it in that moment and I'm finding something to put myself in a state. And I think many people here that I know in that startup scene, they would still feel like, oh, well, uh, my, my approach is in the morning. I do my 10 minutes of, you know, getting into that state. And then the rest of the day, I'm doing this thing where I'm being productive or something else. And I like yeah. that finding it. Yeah, I think we kind of follow different schools of thoughts and, you know, current... Um uh sexy things and so on so i think it's just another sexy thing that that, that people latch on to 
Um, I mean, now my creative work tends to happen spontaneously, mm -hmm. um, but I know that I can do the best work in these situations. So if I need to sort of make, do it properly, then I know these situations work for me. But obviously people change over time. Um, but, you know, I, I think producing the personal stuff, you know, the real human stuff, you know, that requires a lot of guts and, you know, a lot of... Um, bravery and i think physical activity you know generally speaking uh you need you need to be brave and you need to be willing and you need to be committed so i think it sort of ticks all the boxes in terms of the meditation you, you see i come from a very religious background so mm -hmm. for us you know meditation and prayer is sort of part and parcel of of what we do on a daily basis so for us when when we don't do it or we go the other way then that's a bit of a, oh, you know, you know, like if you do porn, for example, or if you do, you know, mm. uh, gang bangs, or, you know, that's like, oh, wow, this is like something different, <laughs> you know, to the usual, <laughs> you know, sort of religious individual. Whereas other people who are, who are in that environment, it's absolutely normal. And doing the meditation is actually worth celebrating because it's like a big deal. Yeah, but yeah, for yeah. us, it's like the other way, it's doing all the, the naughty stuff is a bit of a big deal, but you can't really celebrate it. Then you'll be burnt alive. But um, that's a different matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, I think meditation, one of the... I was listening to a podcast and there was an, an expert on meditation, a uh, professor in the US, I can't remember her name. And, and, and she was literally saying that meditation is noticing the difference. Mm. So when you notice a difference in yourself or in the environment that is the act of meditation mm. because we're always in autopilot most of the time when you realize something that's the state of meditation uh, so that kind of really worked me up and i thought okay so i need to be looking out for the for, for these um glimpses of of change that i that i didn't notice before um and you know as you said it's a fleeting state you know you're not expected to be in a state of meditation all the time um but yeah there are certain times when you're in the flow and that's another form of meditation and and for me you know having certain conversations um you know doing these physical activities that that puts you in that state of flow and i think that's when you produce the best um the best stuff in your work yeah yeah i mean i mean it's interesting that you know you you sort of grew up as a uh as a son of a uh, a physician <laughs> and then you kind of said fuck it you know i'm 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 doing my own thing and so on and then you went sort of to the extreme and then something pulled you back so what what was it that pulled you back um so i had a mentor in the army and really admired him I wanted to be like him and so on um and uh and at some point he came up to me and he said look i've been thinking about this and we have to talk um, and frankly, uh, I know you will have a good time here for the next years and you will be excited about the things you learn. And I know it's your passion. I feel you. Um, but I know that by the time you turn mid thirties, you will hate your life because you will realize everything here is too politicized. You cannot, um, really unleash your talent, uh, and have the purpose, the meaningful purpose that you seek. Um, and so I'm here to warn you and to recommend that you find something else. Unfortunately, he said, I'm not in a position to give you that advice uh, because all my life I have been in the army and I don't know what the world out there looks like and I don't know what people do. Uh, maybe go study or something. I don't know. And so I thought, well, this was tough for me because, uh, you know, this was a big part of the identity that I built up for myself. And I love. Why do you think he, he why do you think he told you that? You know, I would love to meet him again. I don't know how to find him um, mm. and uh, and uh, and ask him. Mm. Um, the what triggered it is that I was reading a book uh, by a samurai master on how to be a warrior, and I was just basically ingesting everything to understand what that means and how to. I mean, you know, in, in medicine, we know we have a similar thing. You know, where the profession is is very strongly affecting your personal identity and 
we take pride in the heritage and the big doctors and 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 how they behaved and what codex there is with it and all of this. And for me, this was quite similar. And, and I was longing, you know, to find that orientation. And I was looking in like all around the world, including sort of the Japanese way and trying like, to get an idea of what it means. Um, and by the way, I think, uh, although this sounds very counterintuitive, I, I see a lot of similarities between the ethos of like a, a good soldier and uh, and a doctor, right? It's you work on something that where everything is very, very honest because bodies do not lie. Um, in the business world, sometimes that's different or in, in politics. Um, and also it's it's very high stakes. You need a lot of trust in the people that, that you engage with. Um, and uh, you need to know your stuff. Right. If it, it, it is, there's no, just having good intentions is not enough, right? Um, and you see moments where humanity is at its edge, and you try to do the right thing, and so on. That's at least, I know that you know, in the military things also go wrong. I'm not naive on that, but but that's if you want to, if you aspire to be the, the good version of that, um, the ethical version of that, then uh, there are a lot of similarities. And and I wanted to bring stability to other regions and so on to give other people that noble aims I would, yeah i mean this i don't know I, I mean i was born very close to the french border uh my uh my friends were all french i learned french before i learned german in school uh, my parents of course taught me german um and then i had german as a foreign language for one hour per week and uh so then i went to go to the forest with my french friends to play around and we discovered bunkers not knowing what it was and then eventually you know i learned that the very ground that I was born on and raised on was witness to like really disgusting, massive, uh, appalling wars and conflicts for not just, and it's not just World War One and Two, even before, you know, it was a lot of like horrible stuff that happened. And, and so I realized I just had the luck of being born a little bit late that I could have my French friends and speak French and being sort of even feeling partially or very close to their culture. And later I, in, in the military, I trained together with French forces and, and we were comrades and friends and it was, it was cool. Right? So that meant a lot to me and getting to a point where you have that stability was something that I thought was really important. And that, that's kind of what, what very much drove it. And, and so my mentor knew that, he knew that I cared about sort of that part and also um, saw the, the book I've been reading and I took a lot of notes. And I read a lot about philosophy and I realized that that samurai was actually contradicting himself all the time and I didn't find him very intelligent. And so I was just basically criticizing uh, and I was really disappointed because he's a hero essentially, but I, I thought like actually it must have been quite stupid. Um, and so this mentor of mine asked me if he could have the book. And so he saw my notes and that's what triggered it in him because then he really started to understand how I feel about this and how much I really tried to get there. And be like the 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 ideal version of it and and felt that I, I would need to find another home um so i think that's i don't know he, he must have seen something and felt the need to warn because i think he, he understood who i wanted to be maybe he just didn't want another Nietzsche within the uh you know army and you know uh, f for you to come along and disintegrate that that whole institution he said mate please not here yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, go to another army. Um, <laughs> I think um, it's it's a theme though that I found recurring, and and then again, like I'm sure a lot of doctors will hate me for saying that, but like when I then went into medicine, I saw the same stuff. Sometimes I felt like um, so much talent of people who spend a lot of time becoming a doctor or becoming a nurse, um, who spend a lot of energy, sometimes money and so on to, to really get to that position with a strong drive, wanting to achieve something. And then you make them type off faxes into a computer. You give them like the worst IT infrastructure, um, uh, you know, like all of that stuff. Where I feel like so much potential and there's somebody just constantly throwing so much sand in the cogs um, where I don't know, you know, and and also like we we end up treating diseases that shouldn't be there in the first place because people could be having healthier healthier lifestyles and there's so much um that that I thought was frustrating and it, like I could hear his voice again basically saying you know I, I think you get out before it's too late 
yeah, you're restricting yourself. Um, and so now I'm in this place where as an entrepreneur, um, yeah, probably even the social expectation is that I'm a mismatch or, you know, that I kind of do like, things that are outside of, of the normal range of, of behavior. Um, and I can shape and do things in a way that, that I think is right. And, and even more so sort of this reflection on what is ethical, uh, especially in the age of AI is, is also very relevant. So I'm, I think I finally found my place with all of this, um, but it was not obvious to me at all beforehand that, uh, that I would, uh, would encounter sort of these, these systemic challenges on that, um, on that journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I felt out of place in medical school totally. You know, yeah. it was I made a mistake basically. You know, I think the the first month I went to medical school, I thought, shit, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. you know, with 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 your parents and you know your social group and your peers, you think to yourself, well, maybe the next stage will be a bit easier. Maybe the next yeah. stage will be a bit easier, and you just sort of keep going through the the hurdles until until that's it. You know, something cracks and you just fall apart, mm. and and that happened to me. And um, so when 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 did you realize that? Oh, here we go again. I'm in the. Uh, was it sort of in the middle of medical school or during training or? Oh yeah, I think. Uh... I like this idea of epiphany moments, you know, like this, mm -hmm. this moment when you realize one thing and it changes how you fundamentally think about things. I needed a couple of those um, for that specific uh, discovery. Um, and one was I was working in a trauma unit as a medical student in South Africa. And, and I was really amazed by the doctors and it was, it was great. It was, it was also where I think probably humanity's best and worst um it comes together and, and you see gunshot wounds all the time and, and i don't know rapes stabs burns you name it um and and I, I i thought this was a really gratifying work at first because you sometimes have people that are completely healthy something disastrous happens to them you can intervene and you can actually see how they go back to their lives but then i realized going back to their lives often means being exposed to the same threats again being traumatized, uh, not having like a really well functioning law enforcement system and and so on and so on. And uh, and it felt like fighting the Hydra. So, you know, you, you chop off one head, you, you treat one patient and then two new patients come back uh, for each of them. Um, and sometimes perpetrator and victim are next to each other. And it turns out the victim was also perpetrator last week. And, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's a mess. And, um, and that made me feel like, do I really want to be somebody who stitches up social wounds, wounds that really shouldn't be there? Or do I want to be a bit more upstream and try to change things? And then uh, I made friends with an, uh, a pharmaceutical engineer and he was working as a student on a project where he wanted to develop new antitoxins against snake bites in a way that would be much cheaper, last longer and do not have anaphylactic uh, reactions as a side effect. Um, and um, then, then I thought, you know what, if you manage to pull this off, um, and you would do nothing else in your life afterwards, then you would have a much, much, much higher impact than I ever could, no matter how many night shifts I pull off and so on. So I'm not suggesting every doctor should be leaving, but if you're already thinking about that, and if, if you feel like for me, sort of, I wanted to do something more creative and so on. And then this realization that there are a lot of things you can do where you can truly have like a, a massive change um, for society or for, for the planet or whatever, then then that that's getting quite interesting. And so I started to put myself on that journey um, step by step in search for the things where there's just a bigger lever um, and some, some creative work. And that happened during my medical studies, both of this. And it was, yeah, two epiphany moments, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, was was it easy sort of being a medical student to, to 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 reach out and you know do these creative things good point um you know because we have medical students that sort of listen to this and and you know they're having second thoughts about yeah. the traditional path i mean i think uh, one 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 thing that i realized for myself at least very early is that I tend to be, and I think that's true for many people, um, highly influenced by my environment. 
And so I got very careful that how do I curate my environment? And as a medical student, I believe it's quite easy to just stick with your medical student friends and just talk about medicine and go to medical parties and, you know, spend some time watching Grey's Anatomy in your free time. And, and then you have your own eco chamber built out right for you. And what probably works better is really trying to take the discomfort and maybe also sit in, in lectures of, I don't know, a business class or something else and try to befriend people um, with more diverse backgrounds. And, and I mean, frankly, not just like academically different, but also culturally and uh, geographically and, and, and in many ways and, and try to get out of that homogeneity that we, I think, have quite strongly. Many doctors would disagree. They would say, no, no, no. The uh, ENT doctor is such a different animal from the anesthesiologist. But then I would yeah. say the fact that you emphasize that right now already proves me right. Um, because if you really zoom out and you talk to a Japanese machine learning engineer and I don't know, to uh, an uh, Iraqi psychologist or whatever, then you will realize that, you know, there's much more breadth to it. Um, and so that is one thing, um, maybe getting some training in, in other things. Uh, so yeah. many great online programs out there that just widen your concepts. And I think, you know, what, what we say in, in radiology, this sort of, you can only see it if you know it. I think that's very true for many things in life and uh, really trying to develop more literacy in whatever areas spark somebody's curiosity um, is, is a very good step forward. Um, but a big, big, big topic, which we touched on earlier is the topic of identity. And I believe a lot of people like to go into medicine also because they like to have that identity, which is a strong brand, a strong role to have in society, something that people recognize. You mentioned your parents, you know, and the mm -hmm. family and all of this. But it's quite worthwhile trying to free yourself from this addiction to um, letting like some abstract identity shine on your own versus trying to really find out what is your own identity and then who do you really want to be, which go in all sorts of directions and you know might might be more interesting in on the long run yeah i i i totally agree with you i totally agree with you i was i was totally uh uh possessed by the spirit of the doctor <laughs> yeah you know i mean for for a long time and and, and um slowly but surely as as you said it's looking in different directions and see what catches your eye and yeah. you know going towards it even though it's got nothing to do with medicine or surgery or anything else um I mean, the day that I stopped actually operating, that that was a big thing for me because most of my mind was on the operations and I would eat, sleep and, you know, uh, defecate surgery 24-7. <laughs> um, but the moment I, saw, I said, well, actually, there's there's another way to this. I mean, it was OK, but I never enjoyed it to the extent that, yes, this is my passion. Yeah. Um, other surgeons they love it it's like yeah. this is this is this is them and I, I totally love it and i and i love what i see um but yeah it's it's changed and having the guts to kind of go with that i think that's yeah. you know that's really important and um and i get that a lot like uh a lot of doctors reach out i mean you get the same uh but um, the question that surprised me among really among the most was this this precise question: on What do I do with my identity, or how, what do I tell other people why I'm not a doctor anymore? And first of all, you are a doctor anymore, uh, or still, yeah. just because you 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 left the bedside doesn't yeah. mean you're not a doctor anymore. There are a lot of non-clinical roles that people very naturally would call a doctor role. I would say that my role is very medical still in a different way, but. Um, and even just like not, you're still a, you know, you're still a trained killer, but in a different exactly. way as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There you have it. You can't take it out. Um, yeah. I'm not going to mess with you. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I remember I was at a conference and then I saw my, uh, my teacher, my surgical teacher and, you know, him being my mentor and so on. I, I told him, look, you know, I've, I've stopped operating and he was so shocked. He yeah. said, "You stop. Oh, you you're a really good surgeon. You know that that was his, you know that was his um, measure of of yeah. me was that I was a good surgeon." And I said to him, "Well, I, you know, I enjoy other things. I enjoy psychology. I enjoy coaching. I enjoy doing yeah. podcasts and reaching out to people that have got nothing to do with <laughs> surgery." And he just couldn't understand it. It was like I was speaking yeah. in 
you know, French or German or something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I have. <laughs> and it shocked me. It shocked me and it got me really upset. Yes. You know, I, I, was, I was upset with him and myself for not realizing how I was kind of, I don't know, duped into this way of living. I, I wholeheartedly empathize with this. So um, another military analogy, right? So the, the U.S. Army for a while, they had this slogan where they said, be all uh, you can be. And uh, somebody uh, who was in the U.S. Army said to me, you know what they actually mean is be all we want you to be. Mm. And um, and I think it's similar in, in in medicine. So when I told people that I would leave the clinic after having worked in, in the hospital for three years, some people stopped talking to me. And by people, I mean like senior doctors that I admired and that, that sort of we were close. And they also had some sort of a mentorship role for me. And the reason why they stopped talking is because they said, you are betraying uh, your heritage. You are betraying us. We need you. So you're betraying society. They paid so much for your medical studies and now you're just going away. Um, you have been bought by money because somebody is offering you more. Obviously, that's the only uh, motivation you can truly have. Uh, otherwise, why would you leave something as great as clinical care? Um, and so basically you're corrupted, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of um, attacks. And then other people also tried to, to hold me back with better intent, but that also didn't help. They said, well, you look, you're, you're not really a doctor until you didn't finish your specialty. Uh, fair enough but why do I care? Um, you know, get that certificate, uh, you know, be behave, you know, get, get your, get, get your diplomas as we expect you to do. Don't, don't stay out of line. Um, and I often had moments where I was in the hospital and, and I wanted to, I don't know, maybe I was in a creative mode and instead I had to draw bloods for hours. And when I was done, there was no more creative mode. So the scientific paper, something that I wanted to write is not now. Um, today I, I can, I can, fairly flexibly design my schedule around the things where I feel like now I'm in the best mode for it. And then you described something similar when you were writing your book, right? So there's a little bit of that. And of course, sometimes you, you're not always in charge of your schedule. That's just how things are. But then also some things were just not okay to do as a doctor because it was not a doctory thing. And I still get that. Now, now I'm an entrepreneur and I don't know, I've done quite some things and then I'm doing something else for fun, like, I don't know, music. And then somebody says, oh, but music, that's a bit too creative and uh, maybe too silly. You know, why would you, why would you do that? Why don't you stay in the serious world? And I said, because it's what I'm curious about right now. And if somebody it's next a, chapter, next chapter. Yeah. I mean, I'm not becoming a full-time um, musician or something, but like if I want to explore another part of my talents, personality, interests, I don't want to feel like I need to apologize for it, you know. Don't I mean, take it too far. Then you turn into like P. Daddy or someone like that. So you've got to be careful. <laughs> got to be careful. You're right. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> it's true. But it's quite surprising, I must say, you know, all these different. <laughs> yeah. God knows what, what, what Elon Musk is up to. So, you know, let's yeah. see what happens. Let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. so what, what, what got you interested in, you know, the dark arts of, of, you know, artificial intelligence and all that sort of weird world of, you know, no one knows how it works sort of thing. True. I mean, um, what I often heard in the hospital was that people said, oh, we just need more staff and then things are going to be solved. And, and that I felt never was convincing because first of all, where do you get that staff from? It's not like we have a lot of doctors just sitting around waiting for somebody to tell them to do some work. Um, and, and then a lot of doctors don't want to work outside of a city in like the darkest outskirts somewhere. Um, and it's also, I think it's difficult to force them to do so, which in some countries is a thing. Um, so that is one thing. Um, at the same time, we're letting doctors waste so much time on meaningless activities. In, in no industry would you find highly trained people like doctors type off documents uh, for hours on end um, or draw bloods. I mean, that's a, maybe a German thing, but in Germany, it's like the nurses are not formally allowed to do it until you delegate it to them, but they can also refuse to do it. And so often doctors end up doing it. Um, and... Uh, 
I actually had a nurse once do it for me. And then she asked me to not tell anybody because they're not supposed to help the doctors. And then she was afraid that she would get uh, weekend shifts. So she was doing it clandestinely. Um, <laughs> uh, how did we get to this? Um, how, how, how did I get into it? So I think one cool thing about software and digital in general is, and including also, of course, AI, um, is that it can take away a lot of the things that we never wanted to do and give us more focus. Um, that's the easy part. The more interesting part is I think it can fundamentally change things that we're not going to solve by just throwing more bodies at the problem. And, and that includes like, how do we move from a very centralized healthcare system to one that is decentralized into the everyday lives of people that really aims at collecting truly meaningful data rather than just episodic, oh, the, today your blood pressure was a bit too high or you know, do like a seven day profile and then let's talk. Um, uh, it, it can move from sort of an output to a truly outcome based healthcare system. And, and also, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you know this much better than me, but I mean, so often doctors fail at distracting, uh, extracting the right um, personal preferences of patients, right? This is the, the other type of the silent misdiagnosis where you might might get the treatment right and the diagnosis right and so on, but you're not adjusting the treatment to the personal preferences of that patient. And, mm -hmm. and that causes more problems. Doctors don't have the time to ask quite often or they're not trained enough for it, but you could easily use like a GPT-based AI that interrogates patients around their personal preferences also and, and then gives you a full report that says this patient actually likes gardening and so therefore maybe the, the knee replacement might not be the right thing for her, although she keeps asking for it because then she can't bend her knee properly to do gardening work. Maybe let's try physio first and, or let's give her a high bed, you know, like this kind of mm. more, more personalized discussion. I think this is where AI can be really, really good. Um, I mean, can these, can these be applied to sort of third world situations or, or is it just a first world? um something um, that you can apply this to yeah uh, this is a really really important question uh of course um because the needs are great there i mean you know th thinking about my country and sort of introducing ai healthcare into that situation would oh. be absolutely beneficial because um the needs <laughs> are just you know astronomical uh yeah. and the doctors are still treating it in a traditional way yeah um so I mean, it makes sense that that you can put it into any situation, and it will produce some interesting results. the The only bottleneck, on my view, at the moment for AI is compute. So having enough chips mm. uh, in in clouds and so on, and is energy. So unfortunately, mm. the energy and CO two footprint is very strong. So we need to get better on that front. But um, uh, it is definitely cheaper to have an AI do a lot of that sort of stuff than doctors. And especially in areas where doctors are scarce, having a good way of triaging patients continuously and, and telling people, no, you need to go to this doctor, you should be going there, can help reduce the burden on the system by reducing misallocations. And also by helping some people seek medical help earlier where otherwise it would get too bad versus others could have um, something else where you know the problem is not quite big enough to, to warrant a, an emergency department visit um i once had a patient here in berlin actually um who came up with like a cheek this big and uh, i asked him how did that happen and it's been growing for like an abscess growing for days and days and days i don't know how he managed to, to, to do that and then I told them, I'm sorry, I can't help you here because we don't have a max fax, we don't have dentists and so on, and probably go somewhere else. And by the way, please come earlier for that stuff. It doesn't have to get that <laughs> can't swallow anymore, which was the reason why he came. Um, yeah. And then he turns around and he walks, uh, only moving his left side of his body. Jesus. And there's the whole family. And I'm like, oh, what? Sorry. Can you explain to me what's happening to your right body half and he says oh i can't move that for three weeks now by the way i forgot to ask do you think that could be a stroke because i had one before and <laughs> i look at him like, my goodness how does that happen now that's a big massive educational gap yeah um and of course i send him to an emergency room with like a 
uh, neurology and so on. But um, it, yeah, but half his brain's gone. So it's yeah, it's time is brain, and and and, and three weeks. I mean. Um, but there are like with phones potentially or with typing behavior, you could even detect micro infarctions and so on and, and, and respond much, much, much earlier. The, the Apple Watch now detects if you have arrhythmia. So maybe if you had that before, you would never know what a stroke is um, and, and, and so on. And, and I believe that um, sensor technology is getting cheaper and so on. And, and there will be a much broader adoption of these things. And that can cost us or save so much trouble, I'm, I'm quite sure. Yeah, so you know the answer is yes. It, it'll be very yeah. beneficial in the third world world countries because may, may, maybe the uptake there will be a lot quicker than sort of in the developed countries because of regulation and and laws yeah. and and litigations and yeah. and all that palaver. So you know maybe that's something to look into. Um, and you know the population's younger there as well. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I the younger generation. Are... Don't have that baggage that that the you know the older generation have. Exactly, you are about to do really important work. I'm quite sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's important, and and um, I think um, if we can break those barriers and show that we can work together, I think that's really important. It just allows people to think differently. You know, knowing that that you are an assassin and a you know a paid killer. And then you became a healer, and now you're sort of in the in the dark arts of entrepreneurship and and AI. So yeah. it kind of gets worse and worse, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait for what's next. <laughs> so, so you know, what is next? Because, like, yeah. you know, you're 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 quite passionate about sustainability and sort of you know the future. Um, mm. You know, does this world still exist? So that's another massive massive challenge yeah i mean um you know i don't want to put too much on burden right on now, you you know <laughs> can handle it um what we're working on right now is uh, trying to teach machines how to smell and if you think about how limited our senses are first of all we only have like five macro senses if you will um, and there's more, there's radiation and uh, magnetism and all of this. Um, we don't even have a sense of that. And then within each of these senses, we're not capturing quite so much. They say that for the for the eyes, it's 0.003% 0. 0, uh, 0, of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example. And now machines are gradually outperforming our senses. So the perception that machines have is probably going to exceed. Um, their ability to also maybe with, with much less bias make decisions and inter interpretations on the back of it is also growing. Um, and then they they are not bound to have the senses in the same place where you have the the processor. You can just have it centralized. And people say that by twenty thirty we will be collecting one yotta byte of data. And one yotta byte, if you would put it on DVDs and you would stack them, according to the Nature publication, it is from the earth to Mars wow. every year with all the LIDAR and satellite and phones and everything we're creating. So um, I think we reach a point where, you know, we will not understand what these machines are doing uh, in no way. And so we need to figure out how they can talk to us and how we can interface with them in a way that we can still trust. Um, and I believe this is one of the key challenges we have uh, for the next mm. decade mm. and and do you think we can coexist and and find a, a meaningful relationship in this yeah i'm 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 in a hopeful camp um <laughs> but some people say uh worrying about about this is like worrying uh about overpopulation on mars and it still takes a while but i mean who knows who knows things are going really fast these days eh? do you think we'll get there to mars I'm not sure this is a populatable planet, honestly. I don't know how what you, what you feel. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we've got so many problems here. We've got so many problems here that, that we haven't solved. Yeah. And it makes sense to sort of make the best of, of what you have before you start going yeah. out and, you know, doing weird and wonderful things. Um, I'm a fan of, like, 
you know making sure your house is in order before you go out and and start Yeah, yeah, you know you, you know doing weird things yeah, that's the doctor thing. Like, I think we like to really focus on like concrete problems ahead of us often, uh, which yeah I like. I, yeah I, I think it keeps you sane and i like to stay sane you know i think that's really important and you know if you're sane you're more likely to to be healthier and make the right decisions and so on um but yeah i mean there's a lot of potential here and i think if we can include everyone into the potential and 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 have all the stakeholders involved Oh yes. you know i think that's really important um and and having these conversations which is why we sort of do these podcasts because it creates other ideas and other insights and people Yeah. might might get other you know Yeah. eureka moments uh, from these conversations and you know people have reached out to me and and you know some are in tears and some are in total ecstasy and 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 others are really angry and so it's like you know the whole gamut of of emotions and um impulses coming together um but it's great you know it's it's great that that, that um multifaceted people like yourselves you know are around um and it does give inspiration and it does give um impetus for other people to go out there and, and to be brave enough to you know go and do the things they've always wanted to to do Mm. Mm. I'm increasingly 100% agree that the more I get older uh, the more I believe that this is the, the truth and it sounds stupid right you've seen the Nike commercial where it says like just do it or uh, everybody tells you to be yourself nobody knows what that actually means um, but a simple guide is to just I mean, listen to yourself in the sense that if you realize something seems uh, silenced inside of you for whatever reason, to meet other people's expectations, to meet a certain identity or whatever it is, um, I think it's worth really listening into it and asking yourself, what is this? What 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 am I missing? Um, and it might... I think the second big problem that at least my sort of generation over here we often have is that people kept telling us, oh, just follow your passion and the rest will be fine. And I don't know, the universe will bend to your will or whatever is going to happen. I don't know. But this mantra of follow your passion and the question then, of course, is how am I supposed to know what my passion is? Uh, I had so many people studying medicine with me that did it because they liked Grace Anatomy or House or something like that. And then they realize that reality is, is not quite like it. And then are frustrated on the back of that. Or maybe they still discover something that they that they like. But um, often when people think they're passionate about something, it's based on very shaky uh, data. Um, and then also people change. So maybe at some point you're not passionate about it anymore. Um, plus, I think telling people that the, the most important thing is your passion, I think is a very egoistical approach and uh yeah i think what i've what i've learned is focusing on things that that you're good at or that where you would like to find out if you're good at or not starting from that is a very good one and then figuring out where can i create value for other people um that's also often quite easy to find out and, and these are great starting points and then you can still calibrate further on okay which which of these things make me passionate where, where am i getting more excited And then it's an iterative process. It's not like you, you're throwing a dart and you're exactly at the center of your um, ikigai Venn diagram of uh, do what, what, what you're good at, what you like, what people need and where you get paid for. No, this is like an iterative process of like gradually getting there. And then also, I guess, to some degree of opportunity. Um, the things I can do now, I can only do because I met the right engineers and right investors and so on. who allow me to focus on my strength and on the things that I like to do, who are happy that I have that because they don't. Um, and in and, and joining forces, we, we can actually build something where we truly believe we have a fair chance of doing something that is going to be meaningful for others as well. Um, but it does take some patience um, and the courage to just try and keep moving, 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 even though, you know, then, like you said, right, you... You go into medicine and you, and you also realize that it's not not fully the right thing and that you're also more in psychology and so on but that's great because if you have a medical background and you're good at psychology and you're very multicultural and you are xyz 
that makes for a really round personality with very strong things to offer to others in ways that maybe also in your next stage of your life, you will realize that there is value that you haven't thought of yet. And, and you're yeah. just building up yeah. assets and you can never go wrong with building up more skills and opportunities no. and learnings. No, no, I mean, absolutely right. Um, absolutely right. Um, I mean, we can go on for another hour and, and um, I think what, what we'll do is sort of, we'll, we'll wrap, wrap it up and, and let our, our listeners delve into your um your work and what you're doing and what you're up to because you know uh you are a busy bunny as they say here in the uk um i i you know i like to end on this what what would you tell yourself you know this friend that's that's um you know thinking of leaving uh the armed forces and going to medicine what what would your three top tips be to him given you've experienced what you've experienced so far in your life so I think um, the num number one is um, uh, it's it's important to be a good rower. It's also important to know what boat you're in and to choose the right boat and the right people you row in and to know also in which direction you row. You will not get all of these things right. Um, but if things are hard, the answer is not always row faster, right? Um, uh, I think that's really important. The, the second bit is... Um, you're definitely a German philosopher, you know. <laughs> German philosophy, uh, definitely. Can you hear it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, then I need to put in Immanuel Kant also, I guess, um, in the categorical imperative. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it while I say number two. Um, <laughs> I think number two is... No, but that's really good because I've rode so many rubbish boats and... Right. And once I stop rowing, it's a breeze. Just sit there. Yeah. And then get off when you have to. Yeah. And the, I think the second one, um, so it, it, another way of putting this would be mind your opportunity cost, right? It's great if you run up a hill, but are you running up the right hill? Um, and, and getting clearer on that and also asking often, and I, I, you know, that's the military thing is like you keep marching and you just don't stop. Great. But what's the purpose, you know, and who are you marching with and so on? As a doctor, uh, everything is going wrong in the hospital, you know, and, and you're just trying harder to fix it in the moment. You're not trying to solve the source or you're not asking yourself, is this just maybe really poorly managed? And I should maybe stop trying to juggle all these balls when they shouldn't be there in the first place. And like going on a second degree kind of thinking also and, and thinking beyond oneself and also around the environment. Um, something I, I, I would have liked to have learned earlier. The second thing uh, is um, uh, leverage. So uh, it's great to do one-on-one -on -one work with patients. It's fantastic. Uh, you get that. It, it makes you rich in experience and it's gratifying. It's emotional, et cetera. But um, for example, the, you've written a book, I've written books. And now we have this recording here. That is something that has leverage. It's scalable. Somebody can listen to it tomorrow in a year in five years and 10 years um and sometimes i get people writing to me um that i would have never heard of there was a gp from iran who said look i've seen your video your text whatever and i'm amazed by how much it resonates with my reality although we live in completely different worlds and and that's touching i, I love that um and and getting this is, is really valuable um and the final thing i think is um and I'm seeing that with a lot of my male friends, especially, is uh, I I grew up learning that I need to master this outside world, uh, and you know, being able to able to fight is is good. It makes you strong and can defend yourself. Understanding medicine is great. It always gives you like job security. Plus, you know how to live healthy and etc. Um, learning finance and business and so on. These are all skills to master that, that whole big scary world around you um, and to become, I don't know, more attractive on the dating market, whatever, you know, all of this, what you get suggested. But um, what a lot of my friends who are very successful did not learn and were not made aware of is that it's equally important to master your interior world and to understand your emotions, to understand how to think about them, 
um, how to feel them, how to feel different emotions at the same time. And there are so many like simple resources, School of Life, for example, is something I find absolutely amazing or the book that you have written to um to to, to raise awareness to, to share that vulnerability and and all of that i think this is so important and it's often so neglected because we have been taught that you know this outside world is, is what you need to focus on and not been given any resources so i think that if i had started much 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 earlier um i would have been much wiser on many other fronts and healthier and and so on um yeah, and I think this would be my top three. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I've reached out to you. It's, it's lovely Likewise. speaking to, um, you know, the German world because they shaped a lot of what the West, um, mm. did in in order for it to become such a massive powerhouse in the whole world, and it still mm. is, of of course. Um, and sort of going back to the roots of uh german history german philosophy german religion is is, is such a w wonderful place to to learn from and your point um and uh yeah yeah really great what's what's the best way for, for people to get hold of you um uh, typically linkedin uh yeah. works well um i'm very slow at responding just because i'm overwhelmed with messages everywhere <laughs> but uh, i try um i'm putting stuff up on youtube uh especially for like the common questions on different careers uh when somebody asks me a question i put it up there so maybe there's something that answers questions um and i guess that works best awesome awesome thank you sven it's it's been a great pleasure thank you. truly appreciate it